I told that before the game. I thought the atmosphere was incredible. It reminded me of a you know a playoff or a, a, a conference championship type of atmosphere because it just felt that way. It was electric uh, at the hotel, the drive in. It was it was special. I mean, to me, you could say it was a lot like an SEC football game, but it wasn't like one last year because none of them were quite like that. Coach, what I'm hearing from you is it just sounds like UCLA was tougher tonight. I'm not saying that. I basically said that we'd uh, we tried every way uh, known to man to lose it. Just for fun, let's try something different. Let's go ahead and do our job. Let's go ahead and make it look like Wednesday's practice because we've got nothing to lose. So it was good to go through adversity and same defensively. Like I said, eh, well, not really. That just pisses me off. <laughs> yeah. You thought Blaise Aldridge could you seen his hair? <laughs> if you're gonna wear hair like that, you better be a player. So, yeah, I kind of expected it. Yeah, the quarterback controversy. Uh, I don't. I would never ask myself that because I coach the quarterbacks so I'm a bunch. So I, you know, um, they're not very controversial guys. They're both really nice guys. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, welcome in to the latest episode of that SEC podcast. I'm your host, Michael Bratton. I go by SEC Mike on Twitter. And I'm joined, as always, by my cousin Shane, who goes by Big Orange Vols on Twitter. What are you up to, you big Tennessee homer? <laughs> hey, buddy, what's going on? Oh, man, we were talking about it off air right before we hopped on the lot, <laughs> but I cannot get over this uh, Peyton and Eli Monday night mm. football show. How great was that? Dude, I, I'm telling you guys, I, and there's a lot A lot of people didn't realize it was going on. Uh -huh. uh, myself myself included, to be honest with you, until you sent me a text. And I'm like, what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> so apparently for the listeners, um, during Monday night football, you could watch the regular game on, what was it, like, ABC or something like that. Or I think it's ESPN, and then the the Manning one is on ESPN too. Right. Well, I, yeah, that's what I'm saying. You, so you could watch the Monday night game, then you you can switch over, and it's also doing a simulcast, but it's not having commentary. It's just got Peyton Manning, Eli Manning, and several active NFL guests popping in about every quarter. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, Mike, it was fantastic. I I truly believe that this is going to revolutionize the way we watch football or maybe just sports in general. I, I, I've never wanted to watch a game more in my life because it felt like if first off, it felt like I was hanging out with, with Peyton Manning. So that was cool. <laughs> but, but for second, you know, it, the inside analysis that he's doing, it's, it, it felt like I was learning, man. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. Oh, so. Well, yeah. well, he's sticking on that theme, Shane. You know, yeah. you're totally unprepared, so I came prepared with mine. But okay, I wanted to throw this your way. If they were to do this with college football, let's say SEC mm -hmm. Network or whatever, uh, who would be your two-man booth sitting on the couch breaking down the game? And uh, I'll give you a moment to – you know, chew the fat on that question. I'll throw okay. out mine. I got to go Steve Spurrier, number one. <laughs> I think he would be fantastic. And then I'm going to throw a wild card at you, Shane. We love this guy every time we got to hear him speak, which was not often. Not enough, if you ask us. But uh, remember how great Alabama defensive lineman Quentin Williams was anytime uh -huh. we got a sound bite of him. So give me <laughs> Steve Spurrier, Quentin Williams. That's my uh, college football <laughs> dream team. Uh, do you have any thoughts on uh, who you'd like to see? Yeah, Mike. Uh, for starters, I think that I think the SEC already has them, uh, and and that's that's my my man Tim Tebow. Mm -hmm. I, I I mean, get, say what you want. The man has played. He was a fantastic college player. Fantastic. I mean, he. I don't want to say. Maybe I should pump the brakes there. NFL didn't work out, but he got to experience it. He got to learn from it. I think the the kid probably knows the playbook left and right, inside and out. He'd have no trouble articulating what's going on in the field. So I would think he would be uh, one of the ones I would choose. But you got to have a defensive man. I, I'll tell you, I love Peyton and Eli, but I did. I think the the other than the ending of the game, which was fantastic, I liked when they had Ray Lewis on because it gave a defensive perspective and and I think you got to have somebody from that side of the ball so I'm going to go with 
I'm bringing back the big swagoo, baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think him and Tim worked well together. I think it would be a, a now, now. I'm not saying you have to watch this, but it would be nice to have that alternative, that SEC alternative channel that you can jump over to mm-hmm. and, and feel like you're inside a huddle. I have the offense, defense. I think I think they're missing out, and uh, don't be surprised if this thing doesn't change soon. Hey, a uh, f- little fun fact about the the big swagoo there, Shane. You know he. Tennessee, Philip Fulmer tried to get him to uh, Knoxville. Yeah. I think they wanted him to be, if the, if I recall the story, they wanted him to be a tight end. And Nick Saban, <laughs> I think he wanted to be tight end. And Nick Saban said, brother, you want to play in the NFL, come play defensive line for me. And the, the, the rest is history there with his outstanding <laughs> career at LSU and the Dallas Cowboys and all that. So, and a little salt on that wee wound if I can get in there. <laughs> oh, well, there's plenty of salt out there, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of uh, Nick Saban, Shane, got to throw this comment. This is the only uh, Alabama content we got on the show. But uh, safety Jordan Battle was asked on Tuesday, you know, what's your favorite uh, Nick Saban saying? You got anything? You know, he's so guarded in these media availabilities. What's he like behind the scenes? Jordan Battle let us in on a little inside secret. <laughs> a couple of the other older guys about this, but do you have a favorite saying that Saban has, one of his little coaching, uh, you know, quips he has? Uh, not that I can think of right now because he has so many, but there there are a few I like. And um, he always talking about touch Ds or, or, or you know, uh, suck, uh, suck on D's or all that. How about it, Shane? How about D's <laughs> nuts over here? <laughs> Mike, are you familiar with the word gasher? No. All right. So in, in football, a gasher is when you line up on one sideline in practice and you run from one sideline to the other, mm-hmm. you touch the line, you come back, and then you do it again. So you go there, back, there, back. It's about 53 yards wide. So you can imagine doing that four times. That's called a gasher. And as a football player, you absolutely hate those. And and the reason I bring that up, Mike, is because he's running them right now. (laughs) (laughs) You say a gasher. I say gasser. Oh, I always called them gashers, man. (laughs) I thought you were going to talk about some gushers here. You remember those? No. no. (laughs) I'll tell you, man, I had a coach in high school, and I swear he he invented new ways of conditioning. I'll I'll never forget, man. He just – he come up with something new every single every single Thursday. Every you know, I have nightmares about that man. Still, <laughs> you run into him at Walmart. You're going the other That's way. Huh? That's right. I, I just naturally hate Coach Brimer. Sorry, <laughs> Brimer, if you're listening, I love you, man. <laughs> well, hey, buddy, we got uh, some preview matchups to get to. You ready to jump around the league? Let's do it. Now let's go around the league. You know, this is not a democracy. Everybody doesn't get what to do what they want to do. Everybody doesn't get to do what they feel like doing. Um, you got to buy in and do what you're supposed to do to, um, you know, be a part of the team and do the things you need to do in practice every day. Uh, sense of urgency, play fast, execute, do your job. You know, guys on the sidelines sitting there pouting. Um, you know, I, I can't stand that either. You know, sit there and pout on a sideline. Um, I, you know, because that's the ultimate and selfish. You know, well, the last play didn't go my way, so I feel so bad. Well, yeah, I mean, nobody thinks, well, you're a tough person when you do that. Nobody thinks that. What they do is they point at you and laugh, and then they nudge their buddy and, hey, you see that guy for this team over there on the sideline? And, 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 and they, they, you know, they'll – use words like wimp, although they'll use other ones too, that I think are even better words with regard to uh, describing what I'm witnessing at times. Mark, we see you as a tough, hard-nosed, boring football coach. You know what I'm saying? Oh, thanks a lot. Who says that? I think Arkansas was an underdog in every game last year, and I know you guys don't worry about it. I know we were, yes. All right, Shane, so we've been waiting to hold off. I uh, wanted to discuss this one with you because we all know how you love you some James Franklin. But, mm-hmm. uh, man, we've got an epic showdown here 
on the road at Penn State, number 20 Auburn, number 12 Penn State, nationally televised. I believe this game's on ABC Saturday night. It's going to be a whiteout. College game day will be on location. Uh, Penn State, number two mm-hmm. in the nation it, with a plus five turnover margin. Auburn leads the nation, 61 points per game, tied mm-hmm. for best in the nation, only allowing five points allowed per game. So, I mean, this is a, a juggernaut battle here. At And Penn State, their first two games, one on the road at the uh, Wisconsin, 16 to 10. So quality mm-hmm. opponent. Then they beat the hell out of Ball State. Speaking of D's nuts, 44 to 13. <laughs> so, and we all know, uh, you know, Auburn just smashed Alabama State and Akron week mm-hmm. week one and week two. So we're going to find out a hell of a lot about uh, Brian Harson and his coaching staff this weekend. We're going to find out if Bo Nix really has turned a corner like it looked week one against Akron. But, uh, you know, how – imperative is it uh or just you know your thoughts on the matchup and and you know this is probably to me aside from everything i just said making this matchup such a big deal for me it's all about finding out what this auburn team is made of because Mm -hmm. i i don't think they can contend in the west if you can't beat penn state what are your thoughts on that well Yes, uh, obviously that's going to be the right answer there, Mike. And uh, there's there's a whole lot of factors here, you know. That that's that's the disadvantage of both of these programs in their first two weeks is they've not really played any tough opponents. So there's going to be a little bit of a come down to earth for both programs come Saturday. You know what I'm saying? Right. Uh, noise factor. That's definitely going. I mean, we got to include that because I I don't I don't know if they're whiting it out or whatever. But oh yeah, you know, no, Penn it's State, definitely definitely a whiteout. Yeah, Penn State can get rowdy, but Bo Nix has been in some loud stadiums. He's been under some you know some tough situations. I think about him back in the 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 Florida Gator game. You remember mm-hmm. that one a couple of oh, years yeah. ago. So I, I think that's going to be the ace up their sleeve is the fact that the guys that are out there on the field are used to havoc, are used to loud noises. And this defense, man, I mean, a lot of people are talking about how many points they're putting on the board, but the defense is starting to play better week after week. So that's I think, is what it's really going to boil down to is how much pressure can this defense put on them. Because, yeah, I have full confidence – and Bo Nix and Tank getting out there and getting it done. Mm-hmm. Well, it's uh, interesting that you talk about the crowd noise, Shane, because that is exactly what Brian Harson's got on his mind, how they're going to deal with that. And uh, interesting question also he got on just, uh, you know, keeping the players focused. You know, they're going to be ready for Saturday, no doubt. But, uh, you know, you got to keep them, uh, their mind on, on, the, on the task at hand, Leading mm-hmm. up, you know, each day you can't be looking ahead to the big matchup. Uh, that is something that uh, Brian Harson addresses right here. And then also, what uh, what are you guys doing in practice this week to prepare for crowd noise in Happy Valley? Uh, the crowd noise, <laughs> there's there's a lot of different ways, um, and, and it's interesting because when you get on a new staff, everybody's done things differently, and so um, I've actually kind of enjoyed hearing though different ways that people have prepared for the noise. But ultimately, uh, we have speakers, you know, we have, we have a speaker system and all that. Um, I don't think that we're going to get it exactly like it's going to be on game night. But we have to, we'll crank the music up or the sound and the crowd noise and music, whatever it is that we have to use to, to make it very loud. Um, and, and then we're going to have to simulate a little bit, you know, that, that we can hear at certain times. Um, so be ready for that. And then I think ultimately, you know, part of part of playing on the road, you know, in a big crowd, you, you do have crowd noise. You do need to deal with that. But it's it's all the other things, too. You're not going to have uh, the rest of your team. You know, we travel 80 guys and, and maybe that might even be better for us um, at, at the end of the day. So, you know, just more focus uh, because there's less less distractions on the side, but you don't have your entire uh, team on the field there. Um, you don't have the whole entourage of, of everybody on the sideline. And so you, you got to get um, that motivation and support from your, your teammates on the sideline there. And um, we got to do a great job of, of being able to just 
identify you know what's happening and and know that the other 10 guys around you are going to do their job and that's a big part of of preparation is knowing the guys around you're going to do their job and because there may not be an opportunity to communicate and our defense has had to to deal with that at home the last two games when, when our crowd has been loud and making it difficult on the offense our defense they're not really having a, a chance to communicate so they got to do it a certain way and now it's roles reversed. Our offense has a chance to do things differently and, and communicate a little bit differently, and they're going to have to do that in the game. So uh, it starts immediately. It starts, um, and, and, and we work on that through the entire week. And then, you know, by the end of it, um, that should just be another factor that, that comes with playing on the road and being prepared uh, for that when we get out when we get out there and play on Saturday. And, um, if we do that right, I mean, that shouldn't be, you know, too much of a factor for us. Although. How you sort of approach making sure your team is is focused, not just the game. It's going to be a completely different mm-hmm. environment, but but really the week you mentioned being day to day and and just taking it one game at a time. How do you make sure that they're not already on Saturday when it's just when it's just Monday? Well, yeah, that, that's great. That, that's a great question. I mean, that's the reality of it. Um, I don't know in their minds, but we're, we're going to we talked about it on Sunday. We talked about. And, and even back this up, let's let's go back. You know, months ago, this wasn't the first time that we had this conversation. Now that we're on the road, we've had this conversation long ago, and that's what I'm saying. Like we we got to remember those things and recall uh, these type of conversations that we've had about. All right, it's Sunday. Let's focus on Sunday. It's Monday. What are you going to do today to get yourself prepared for Tuesday's practice? And and, and here's the reality: some guys like you know there's. When you have a chance to go play every week, you know there's there's guys that have a purpose from Sunday all the way through game day that that they want to win and they're preparing to win. Some guys want to go out there and just participate and be a part of it. So the reality of it is like what we did yesterday matters for what we're ha- what happens on Saturday, but we needed to really focus on Sunday because there was a lot of things that we needed to get right. And we needed to make sure that that from a, a mindset standpoint, uh, we were in the right frame of mind. And today's today's no different. You know, guys are going to come in and they're going to watch and study and prepare um, and be better than they were last week. You know, it's not like we got to throw a cape on now and start doing things completely different. Just just be better than you were the week before. Have a better process. That's really what it should be every single week. And. Some guys will do it, uh, but the biggest the biggest thing is is just the the distractions that come with um, you know playing on the road, playing in a game like we're going to play. Um, I think there's a lot of positive things around the game that we all can enjoy and and uh, you know know that it's a part of just just having a, a great challenge on Saturday. But it, it comes down to the maturity of our team, the leadership of our team, and. Our coaches will will continue to talk to our players about it. We just, you know, we need we need everybody uh, in this circle on this team just to be locked into what we know is the most important thing, which today is about preparation. Tomorrow about our practice and uh, putting all that together throughout the week so we can play well on Saturday and just, you know, not not having everybody else's opinion. All right, Chase. So make no mistake. I mean, this course, uh, like you said, Auburn, they're the SEC. They're no strangers. Yeah to these loud environments here is going to be rocking. You know, I think back to uh, the off season when we had our friend Brent Sianca pick six previews who Mm -hmm. lives in Pennsylvania said, this is just an epic game for those Penn state fans. They've been thinking about it all off season because it's so rare that you get an sec team into your house. But Mm -hmm. I think the recipe here, you hit on it there. The defense so outstanding. We got tank Bigsby, maybe the best running back in the nation. Uh, right. I got to assume that the game plan is going to be, you know, limit mistakes, uh, try to take the air out of the ball, limit Penn State's possessions, and when they do have it, we'll suffocate them on defense. And that yep. is the perfect recipe for pulling an upset on the road, don't you think? Oh, with, not, Mike, not even close. I mean, that's that's what it is. You want to take crowd noise out? You know how you take crowd noise out, Mike? You keep a hold of the ball, you keep those chains moving, and you keep putting points on the board. You do that, then the crowd noise ain't going to be a factor. So that's I think the, the emphasis at practice this week needs to be the trenches 
controlling the line of scrimmage, and, and just keep moving the ball, man, because the longer you hold on to it, that's the less time Penn State has it. And you just, like I said, you can cut that crowd noise out. And interesting, Shane, I mean, this is completely unrelated normally, but I don't know if you saw Southern Cal, they fired their coach, Clay Helton. Mm -hmm. And as soon as that happened, who was the first name to pop up on the board? James. Lane Kiffin. Well, <laughs> <laughs> certainly Lane Kiffin, but the other one, James Franklin. That is the mm. the, the go-to name I'm seeing on all the, the rumor mills and all these sites. So that potentially a distraction for Penn State when you don't need it, certainly with Auburn, Red Hot mm. Auburn coming into town. That's something that James Franklin, we even got uh, comments from this Penn State <laughs> loser here uh, on the distractions of the USC game and uh, mm -hmm. on the fact that, you know, I thought this was an interesting point that uh, considering that uh, Auburn's coaching staff is cons made up of so many coaches from so all over the country and the fact that Auburn's really not been tested these first mm -hmm. two weeks, Penn State, they don't really have a good read on what Auburn's going to do. There's no film they believe on what they're going to see on Saturday. So again, maybe maybe another potential advantage for the Tigers. Yeah, man, and and the fan base is chanting for you guys. You know what I'm saying? It's like I hope they travel well up there. I hope they make their own noise because this. I don't know about you, Mike, but I I hate when the SEC loses games. That that Georgia Clemson game. That I, I was a proud dad watching the <laughs> SEC team go over and kick some ass. Then to turn around to watch LSU drop one to a pack team, you know? So it's just, we get, we need, this is, we're creating a narrative here. How can we be the best conference by going out of conference and kicking ass? And that's what I hope Auburn does this weekend. Um, I, as you guys know, I can't stand in any form of distraction. Um, so I'll discuss this today with the leadership council so that we can make sure that all of our energy and uh, our, all of our energy is on our preparation for Auburn. Uh, and that's how that's how we'll handle it. I'm gonna I'm gonna talk to the leadership council today about it. How difficult can it be facing someone that you have such close familiarity with when it comes to Derek Mason um, as defensive coordinator, being somebody you have worked with for years? Well, I've never worked with with Derek, but I but I know Derek. Um, I know Derek obviously very well. Um, you know, not only personally but also professionally. Um, I, I think probably the biggest challenge uh, for us uh, you know, with these guys is the way their first two games have played out um, and the type of people they have played. Um, you know, it's it's it makes it a little bit challenging on tape. Um, you know, to to evaluate the tape, and again with a new head coach and new coordinators. Um, are we watching Boise State film? Are we watching Vanderbilt film? Um, are we watching Georgia film, Colorado State film, um, South Carolina film? You know, uh, what, what do you watch to get enough um, examples of you know formations of situational football and scenarios that you want to get covered? Uh, you just don't you just don't have a whole lot to work with. Um, you know, when when you when you get into a game and it's a blowout early on, those late game reps are not as as important in your breakdown because I don't know if they are as as realistic uh, of information as you would get um, under a different scenario. So you know, that that's probably the biggest challenge. I wouldn't say it's necessary the familiarity with with me and Derek. All right, Shane. So James Franklin. <laughs> I guess he was not going to – I don't understand what the hell he's talking about here. Uh, he couldn't have talked to his players before this question or, uh, you know, I don't know. But like I said, this is not the distraction that uh, Penn State needs heading into this marquee showdown. And uh, I'm just saying – I'm not saying, mm -hmm. but I'm saying uh, – I don't know. I'm seeing the stars align here for Auburn to go on the road, pull this upset here, and uh, – you know, it is a whiteout, so everybody gets hyped up and says, well, how in the hell can Auburn win in a whiteout? Well, Penn State is 6-6 six and six during a whiteout, so <laughs> they're not even that good at it. So, uh, I don't know. I'm just saying. Trust me. We've been checkering kneeling how long? So, <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that ain't going to be a factor. I mean, what's going to be a factor is, like you said, distractions and overlooking because I'm telling you right now, we, we live in this bubble of the SEC – Outside the SEC, Penn State, 
that there's not one. I mean, even Vegas thinks there's no shot that that uh, that they can go up there and win this game. So that's what you want. You want that super confidence because you want to talk about making a room quiet. That's when you go up there and you punch them in the mouth. Mm-hmm. All right, Shay. Next, let's kick it down to Athens, where we got a big matchup here in the SEC East. South Carolina undefeated on the season, traveling to Georgia, of course, also undefeated on the season. The Bulldogs, huge favor, favorite in this matchup, but uh, we don't know, you know, who's going to be playing quarterback. Mm-hmm. J.T. Dales, Stetson Bennett, maybe Carson Beck. I would assume. If uh, J.T. Dales is good to go, you got to think he's going to get get the start. If he's not, you know, Stetson Bennett played so well last week, it's hard to see him not being the uh, number two option there for the Bulldogs. But, you know, this is interesting because the fact that, uh, you know, so much hype around Georgia and how they're going to crush this South Carolina team. And the number one thing I keep seeing, and both these coaches were asked about it, we'll get to their comments here in a moment, but – Hell, last time South Carolina went into Athens, we all know <laughs> that the, them Gamecocks left the field with a W, and that was with a terrible Will Muschamp as a head coach. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I don't know. I mean, what are your thoughts on this matchup, Shane, considering that um, – does that help South Carolina that the last time they came in here they won, or do you think maybe that's as weird as it may sound – uh, disadvantage because the Bulldogs know for a fact that uh, you know they need to take this team seriously. I, I think it's a disadvantage to be honest with you, Mike. Mm-hmm. Uh, just because this is a, <laughs> I, I keep referencing my high school team like it has anything to do with the Georgia Bulldogs. <laughs> it doesn't. But short story, I, I, we went zero and four <laughs> starting my senior year, and we kept hearing it from the coaches every single week. You know what? You know who else started zero and four? We did back in 99, and guess what? We went to state, you know? So it's just like that was a narrative. Of course, then when we lost our fifth game, they stopped using that one. But <laughs> don't think Georgia ain't got ain't using this, man. Don't You can't overlook anybody because as soon as you do, they're going to come in there and they'll beat you. There's a lot of good players on the South Carolina team, and, you know, I, we don't know the quarterback situation. I will tell you this, Mike. They got it. They need a quarterback, and, and whether and whether it's Doty or or whoever they put back there, they got to have some balance. If they've got, they got to put up points if they want to beat the Georgia Bulldogs come Saturday. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, speaking of that, let's uh, kick it over to Kirby Smart, who uh, gave uh, the latest update on J.T. Dales. He talks about uh, losing to South Carolina last time the Bulldogs hosted them, and uh, on Will Muschamp, does that give? Georgia. Oh yeah, I forgot. And, He's down there. Yeah, I mean that's there's gonna be so many storylines. I, I'm already. Is he gonna, I'm already. Is he over, gonna have his glasses? <laughs> is he gonna have his? <laughs> I am already overshade the fact that uh, this is gonna get mentioned, and we're gonna see oh, Will yeah. Muschamp on every damn time Georgia makes a stop. They're gonna be panning over to see his reaction here on the sideline. But uh, that Kirby addressed that as well. His injury status. Yeah, JT uh, feels much better. He's continued to improve. I think he's better now than he was on uh, on Saturday. I don't know that he's 100%, um, but he's he's certainly getting closer to that. Uh, Stetson is repping, JT's repping, and Carson's repping. So they're they're Stetson's actually got some uh, lower back issues that that he strained some stuff, but he's he's able to go. But I don't know if he's 100%. He's been uh, dinged up. Um, since Monday morning, but he went out and practiced as well. So they're all three practicing, and uh, I wouldn't say 100. I think Carson's 100% healthy, but the other two are, are still pushing back. Kirby, uh, kind of a two-parter here. One, um, South Carolina has a bit of an unknown at their quarterback. Can you share what those quarterbacks do differently? And two, uh, I know you use a lot of different motivations. Will you, will you bring up what happened the last time South Carolina played in Sanford Stadium to the team at some point? No, well, I mean, that that was brought up some last year. I think it was more relevant last year, uh, a lot more similarities in their team last year and their staff, uh, with the exception of, you know, Will being gone. But, you know, what happened the last time they were here was really about us, not about them. And uh, it's all, always going to be about what we do and how we execute. And we're trying to do that at the highest level. And uh, whatever we can do this week in practice to be able to execute at a high level, that's what I want to focus on not the other. Um, as far as our quarterback situation, you know, we got to see uh, Luke last year. Dodie, he's an incredible athlete. Uh, he creates uh, 
problems in terms of extending to plays. You know, he's a really good athlete, and uh, he moved the pocket around uh, against us last year in a different offense, but a good athlete. And, you know, my man down the road right here, Zeb's done a good job. He's come in and uh, played really well. It was interesting. I'm good friends with his dad, and it, getting to watch him play in those first two games was uh, just unique because – he played really well, and I'm like, this this guy, you know, was a GA. He, he jumped in and played quarterback and played winning football, made good decisions, made good throws, and uh, got to be pretty cool for him to get an opportunity to play at an SEC uh, program after going into being a, a GA, you know. And they use other guys at quarterback as well, and uh, they do a good job changing it up, trying to give you a change of pace at that position. Yeah, Kirby, you brought up Will Muschamp and, and him being over here now. How big of an impact does that have this week? I know there's a lot of turnover on their staff and, and personnel. Uh, we I, we went out one second. You said something about Will and the turnover on their staff. Yeah, how big of an impact can he have this week in, in helping you all prepare for their team? Uh, I don't know that. I mean, it's, it's personnel-based, right? It's, we go through this all the time. We went through it with DK on Clemson. We go through it every year. Somebody changes spots. You guys write about it, make a big deal about it. And, <laughs> It's not that big a deal, really. He's not in their meetings. He doesn't know their game plan. He does know who their players are. And uh, I, I just don't know how that helps you a lot. You know, we know what their height weights, and we got the tape, and the tape speaks for itself. He just might know more about them in terms of uh, what strengths and weaknesses there are. So we always do personnel with somebody that knows other teams, and we get the personnel information. But at the end of the day, I think some of these kids can improve and get better and they're a year older, so you don't always know exactly what they're like. <laughs> All right, Shane, so Kirby was not feeling it for these questions. I uh, did not want to field anything on Will Buschamp and South Carolina and all this and the last time they hosted them. But, uh, hey, I'm, I'm just saying that's something to consider because at least uh, the South Carolina players know that what it takes to go down there, go on the road, beat them Georgia Bulldogs. And, you know, this rivalry – has historically been full of just, you know, shocking results. And yeah. I'm not sitting here saying that, uh, you know, I would certainly be picking South Carolina at this point, but I just think cra crazier things have happened. And uh, I think uh, this is the week we're really going to see, considering all of Frank Beamer's history and knowledge on special teams, Mm -hmm. I think we're going to see the Gamecocks throw the kitchen sink at the Bulldogs because they know they're going to have to come up with some tricks uh, to, to make this a competitive ball game, don't you think? Uh, yeah, without a doubt, Mike. But, you know, you got to think, South Carolina has shown their cards quite a bit. What, I'd, what I expect is a little bit more trickery, like you said. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't surprise me if I see Joyner back there a little bit more mm -hmm. in the Wildcat, you know, just trying to mix things up because you're going to have to get creative to 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 win this to win the ball game. I mean that's that's what it boils down to, and it's gonna and it's also gonna have to rely on your defense in case you get a lead. So um, yeah, I, I don't think either program obviously is uh, thinking that they're just gonna walk in there and just get a victory. But uh, you know they're gonna have to play on their toes. All right, so let's jump to the other side, Shane. Let's kick it over to Columbia, where Shane Beamer met with the media here on Tuesday to talk about this game and. My word, Shane, was he talking up the Bulldogs? And he said this is the greatest roster Georgia's ever had. He notes the fact that uh, he was a coach down there when they played for the national championship. He even referenced uh, Jordan Davis of that amazing play where he runs all the way across the field and makes a play 10 yards down the field. Hell, UAB got a first down <laughs> on that play, and the Georgia coaches went nuts because uh, of the hustle by the big man Jordan Davis. I mean, he's just an mm -hmm. animal. I don't know if uh, South Carolina's got anyone that can block number ninety nine, but uh, no, uh, <laughs> you know they don't, Mike. They got they're gonna need a lot. <laughs> How much do you think, uh, if at all, you know, Coach Beamer, you know, talks to his dad about uh, you know inspiring his his team to be overcome the odds and, and you know just racking his brain. You know, I, I'm thinking of like yeah. the Water Boy when he's got that green mm -hmm. notebook with all the secret plays. You know Frank Beamer's got that laying around somewhere, and, and Shane has got to have that thing borrowed this week, don't you think? Oh, yeah. No, all of them, man. And, and not to mention, don't don't overlook the relationship he has with Lincoln. 
don't think he's not reached out to him. So I, oh, yeah. I think he's he's made a ton of calls <laughs> this week. He's made a. I, I it would not surprise me if him and Frank ain't up every night just thinking about some some things they can pull out come Saturday. But um, I don't know, man. I. I, I don't think Kirby ain't either, though. You know what I'm yeah. saying? <laughs> well, let's kick it over to Shane Beamer, Shane, who uh, yeah, he had a really funny story here about uh, what he remembers from South Carolina upsetting Georgia two years ago and uh, just on how incredible this Georgia Bulldogs team is this year. Uh, there is a reason they were picked to win the SEC East, and uh, the talent just jumps off the, uh, the, ta the tape at you. Obviously, they've – had some great players in the past. I've, I've coached against a lot of them. Matthew Stafford and Noshawn Marino and A.J. Green and those teams. I was a part of a really talented team that played for the national championship with Roquan Smith and Nick Chubb and, and Sonny Michelle and, and those guys. But when you just look at uh, their starters on, on all three phases, but then you just look at the backups, um, I don't know of a more talented team ever to play uh, at Georgia when you uh, – when you look at that, I mean, I had read over the summer that the defensive back, the secondary was an area of concern. And, and all I see are those guys just playing everybody in man coverage and, and nobody can nobody can complete a pass. Uh, I, I watch their their defense. I think they forced 18 punts already this season in two games, which if my math is correct, that's going to put them on pace for over 100, which is an ungodly amount of defensive stops like usually at the end of the season a defense may force 70 or some punts uh, they have forced an average of nine the last two games um, I'm sitting there watching tape all day yesterday got in at 5 30 in the morning and was was all day watching tape like the rest of our coaches and thought I had a bead or not a bead but thought I had a good feel for the personnel then here comes another guy at the end of the game against UAB that's not even listed on there too deep. That's that's making plays that would start a lot of places in the SEC. Uh, there is a play where Jordan Davis, their unbelievable defensive lineman against UAB, where the UAB quarterback runs. Uh, Jordan Davis for Georgia is outside the hash into the UAB sideline, and the quarterback for UAB starts running towards the Georgia sideline, and the defensive lineman Davis, all 340 pounds of him runs the quarterback down and makes the tackle on Georgia's sideline. And it's one of the most amazing individual efforts and plays I've ever seen. So they are really, really good and uh, will be a big challenge for us. But our guys are, are certainly excited to, uh, excited to go play. We've had a couple of day, great days of practice and uh, looking forward to the challenge of, of going in there against such a uh, talented and well-coached team. So the hype for them is real, and we're excited to go play. Shane, after watching the Georgia film, I'm sure you saw the, the Clemson game. How much of a concern is your pass blocking when it comes to Georgia's defensive line? Yeah, I think a lot has been made of the pass blocking, which is a bunch of crap. Uh, regardless, I've got tons of respect for what PFF says and all that. PFF doesn't got I mean, much respect for them. They help us. We rely on their stuff. They don't know when our quarterback goes up to the line of scrimmage, makes a protection call to slide the offensive line one way because he thinks the pressure's coming, which means the a tackle for us is going to slide one way. And then he realizes that the quarterback guessed wrong and there's a free guy coming outside of him. So to the average eye, people are going to say, oh, my gosh, what is that offensive tackle doing? That offensive tackle is doing exactly what he's supposed to be doing, and he's trying to take the hit off the quarterback because the quarterback slid the line the wrong way. Uh, so have we been perfect on the pass pro? Uh, no. Is it as bad as – some people want to analyze and, and say that it's been absolutely not. And then so on all of us, quarterback, running backs, receivers, tight ends, offensive linemen. So to answer your question, David, it's a concern every week, but certainly against these guys because they're really good up front. And all you got to do is turn on the tape of the Clemson game and, and they're swallowing up Clemson's quarterback, it seems, on, on every play when he drops back to pass. So it'll be a huge challenge for us, a lot more than what we have faced the last uh, two weeks, obviously. But – it's like I told our guys this morning. I mean, it's SEC football. There, there's uh, you better strap it on for the next however many nine, ten games, nine SEC games, eight, eight SEC games that we got here the rest of the season because it gets real. And if you don't want to play against the best, and you shouldn't be playing in this conference.
you've been pretty forthcoming about the fact that you followed the program from, from afar. What do you remember about the game against Georgia two years ago, watching that from where you were? What were your kind of reactions to that? And do you use that game from two years ago as a reminder that, hey, that team was a big underdog as well. You can go in and, and do something similar. Yeah, I don't remember much about it. We were playing Texas at the same time that day. I think I may have told some of you all the story, but – our game against Texas, which is an unbelievable game, not to change the subject, but if you ever get a chance to go to that game in the Cotton Bowl, do it. Uh, but we were playing Texas, which is a huge rival for us at Oklahoma. Uh, Georgia and South Carolina were playing the same day. We won. Jalen Hurts was our quarterback, had a great win against Texas. And my family runs on the field after the game, and I'm thinking they're going to be excited because we just beat Texas. And swear to goodness, the first words out of my kids' and my wife's mouth is, South Carolina just beat Georgia. South Carolina just beat Georgia. And uh, I'm going, <laughs> Oklahoma just beating Texas. Uh, I'm more worried about that one. Uh, but – that's what I remember about it, and obviously a great win. Um, I don't talk about it. We haven't talked about it. I mean, we may mention it, but to me it has – from a lot of the people are different. Uh, the coaching staff here is different for the most part. Some of the players were here that day. Um, some of them weren't. You know, obviously, uh, I think our guys know you went over there a couple of years ago, and I saw what Kirby said yesterday. A lot of that was because of Georgia, you know, the fact that – uh, South Carolina won that game, uh, but again, it doesn't have a big impact, I don't think, on on this year's game. I mean, we. Have All right, Chase. So the Gamecock <laughs> blood runs deep in his Beaver family <laughs> before they even uh, were head coach down here in Columbia. But uh, you know, there's I, that just gives you an idea of uh, just what this game means to uh, Beamer and his family. You know what? Yeah, definitely, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next day, let's kick it all down to Oxford. We're an interesting game here. Ole Miss, red hot Ole Miss facing Tulane. And before you roll your eyes and say, what the hell, Tulane? Remember, they mm -hmm. almost beat Oklahoma in the opener. That was a 40 to 35 game mm -hmm. on the road at Oklahoma. They turn around, they beat the hell out of Morgan State, whoever the hell that is, 69 to 20. And Lane mm -hmm. Kiffin says this is an SEC roster <laughs> that they're facing on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> Shade tried to hold back his laughter here. I'm but uh, <laughs> They used to be in the SEC. I, I mean, that's the only thing I uh, Maybe that's what Lane's talking about 100 yeah, years ago. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, I really do think uh, with this coaching staff, Willie Fritz, I think is his name, every time yeah. there's a coaching search, this guy's name gets mentioned time and time again. They've got Chip Long as their offensive mm -hmm. coordinator who was at Notre Dame. Uh, not last season, but the previous time they went to the uh, college football playoff. So they've got some good coaches here. And uh, yeah. you know, this is, I think, going to be an interesting matchup here. Oh, yeah. I mean, definitely. You can't sleep on anybody, Mike. I mean, look at, look at, ask Florida State. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you, you can't, you can't take anyone for granted. So, uh, uh, but like you said, this was a team week one that we kind of all watched because we couldn't watch uh, – there was another SEC game that was coming on. We had to wait till this thing wrapped up. And I'm like, oh, my God, Tulane's going to win this damn thing. And honestly, if it weren't for a couple of terrible calls, they probably would have. So, uh, Oklahoma's not a pushover, so you cannot sleep. I, I don't think you could sleep on this Tulane team. I guess going off of that, what stands out about what their offense has been able to do so far? They've put up big numbers, but what have they been doing to, to succeed so well? Really multiple, um, well coached. They cause you issues. Looks like you know he's done it at a number of places, but you know can change week to week and and look at what you do and give you problems, not just run plays. Um, <laughs> you know, like a lot of people do. So, and a really good quarterback that can move again. Clay and I had noticed this morning that one outlet had. Graded your offensive line out Saturday as the third best unit in the country over the weekend. Uh, that was without your starting center in the lineup. Just what have you thought about those guys up front through the first two ball games? Well, I don't know what outlet that is, but pro football focus. Okay. Well, pro football focus don't know a whole lot about watching film, so no disrespect. But we didn't play real well up front. I know the numbers look good, but. You know, tell pro football focus to realize we're running into five-man boxes most of the time because they're staying deep because of these three receivers. So you're supposed to be able to run into that. 
Um, you know, we got beaten pass protection one-on-one -on -one matchups. Um, quarterback had to get rid of the ball early, so I was not pleased how he played up front. But what do I know? Uh, a couple weeks ago, Spencer Rattler, after they played Tulane, said it was like the most physical team he had ever gone against. Does that come through on film? It does. <clears throat> and like I said, they got a lot of a lot of good-looking players. You know, they start different guys in two weeks on defense. They rotate them in. Um, it really looks like they have, you know, 22, 24 players about that they feel really good about. And that's a good thing to have, um, you know, because they stay fresh and probably had a lot to do with how well they played <clears throat> in the second half versus Oklahoma. Um, and really they gave up no big plays in this last game until the end when it was out of hand and, you know, it looked like a third team was in. So <clears throat> they're really good. You can't go on past, you know, different years, different games don't mean anything, you know. Sometimes the week before don't mean a whole lot. But, you know, you look at what these guys have done, they've played really well. And – against some really good players in week one. All right, Shade, last item here. Let's kick it on day to Mississippi State, where them Bulldogs, Shane, traveling on the road to Memphis. Memphis 2-0 on the season. Beat the hell out of Nichols 42-17. And then last week beat Arkansas State 55-50. And, man, hmm. you know, this is a tricky game. We've been talking about it, uh, considering Memphis is averaging 48.5 points per game. And not saying mm -hmm. they're going to do that against Mississippi State's defense, obviously, but, you know, this could be a really high-scoring game. And, you know, still waiting for this uh, Pirates offense to, you know, really hit gear here in the SEC. They've been struggling, and I, I know some of the numbers are good, but uh, last week against NC State, the offense just never really clicked. And not that they needed it in their uh, commanding win there, but uh, they I think – I think they may need it in this game. If they get out into – if you know, if Memphis keeps finding ways to score points, I mean, I think it's a little bit of a tricky game for the for the Pirate and company. What do you think? It, it could be, Mike. But, I you know, I, I'm not expecting any letdown from this defense either. This defense is getting strong, buddy. And uh, that's what I expect. I, ex I expect them to just smother Memphis and hopefully not have to be too dynamic on offense. I mean, I, I know it, it, it sounds crazy, but – if the pirate doesn't have to get crazy over there, then why should he? Just let them, just let them beat them with the defense. Go out there, win the ball game, just like they did with the NC State. This is a big game, Mike. A lot of people aren't talking about it, but there's a little triangle up there: Old Miss, Mississippi State, and Memphis. Mm -hmm. And those guys, I, I mean, you want to talk about recruits? This is what this is about. That you want to be the best team in that little area. So that's this is a big one for Mississippi State, man. So let's kick it over to the Pirate Shade, who's asked about uh, his experience there in the Liberty Bowl. This is fantastic. He was asked about his favorite kickoff times, and for some reason, he went on a weird tangent on this one. Coach, I don't know how far you're along in your film review, but what have you seen from the Memphis defense? And <coughs> have you had any experiences at the Liberty Bowl before? Uh, I broadcast a game one time at the Liberty Bowl. That's as close as I got. Um, <coughs> Memphis defense, they run around good. They're fast. Um, uh, the biggest thing that jumps off is experience. They've all been there. They're all seniors. Um, uh, you know, they've... Uh, well, they've started more games than uh, uh, than some of those guys have started more games in college than our kids did in high school. So uh, we'll go out there and see how it goes, you know. Do you have a uh, preferred kickoff time that you like the best? I think three. I think three. It's um, I think that window somewhere between uh, you know uh, two and four is about the best time. Uh, is my favorite time. I'm out, most of them I've had are you know, kind of the 6.30, 7.30 range. So, you know, Chip, Chip Kelly wants the people in Manila to see the game. So I guess uh, I, I, I would like to think that some of my teams are pretty popular over there too. <laughs> All right, Shane, so Mike Leach, is uh, he wants to be internationally known as uh, the Mississippi State's football <laughs> coach, and I think he certainly does uh, help raise the profile of Mississippi State football, and as long as he keeps winning, uh, man, I just I love comments like this. You know what? 
Yeah, me too. It makes you wonder what, like, what what's he going to do after retirement? <laughs> you know, you, you track down and find out he's been coaching a little little league team in Manila. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Maybe he's the next. Uh, maybe he'll join the Mannings on one of these uh, Monday night football yeah. shows. You know? What? Oh golly, yeah. You talk about a wild character. <laughs> all right, Shade. So that's all I got on this episode. You got anything before we uh, hop off the line here? No, man. It's going to be a great weekend. I've, I've been looking. I've even been looking ahead, Mike. There's <laughs> there's some ball games around the corner that that I'm just I'm just glad college football's here, Mike. I tell you, I'm I'm pumped up that we got the show going and. And, uh, man, it's, it's, it just seems like it's going good. Good news coming up this weekend. I think we're going to have an electric one. And and uh, who knows, maybe a couple upsets. Yeah, absolutely. And I've got uh, Florida guests lined up. I've got an Alabama guest lined up before the weekend gets here to preview that epic showdown mm-hmm. in the swamp. So it's going to be a great week. Hang with us here for the rest. Uh, you know, we go every day, of course. So really appreciate you, Shane, hopping on the line. I really appreciate each and every one of the listeners We'll catch you on the next one. All right. See you guys. Go Vols.